Welcome to Consulting Mastery, where we help B2B consultants master the business of consulting. I'm Carrie, And I'm Ahmed. Join us as we explore the art of delivering outstanding client value, earning a higher income, and thriving in today's marketplace. Why don't consultants charge what they're worth? Are you presuming that all consultants don't charge what they're worth? Absolutely. The vast majority except the uber successful who are the minority. Yeah. Yeah. And I tend to agree with you. And it's interesting that we have this conversation over and over and over again with our clients, right? Who are just agonizing over pricing. And um, then months later, <laughs> realize that all that agonizing was for naught because they were still undercharging uh, relative to the value they're bringing. So I would say to answer your question, you know, one of the, the most obvious reasons is that so many people still charging out for their time. So this notion of, you know, either their time or the resource that they're using, right? So my time is worth $250 an hour. Even that seems crazy, right? Or I am having somebody else do this work and they're charging X, therefore I should, you know, upcharge it by X percent. And that's all that they can really stomach, and, you know, the big shift in the conversation we'll, I'm sure, have today is when you stop thinking about charging based on your inputs and start charging based on your outputs. So a few summers ago, my nephew was visiting from Virginia. They lived down, down in the States in Virginia, and they were visiting for the summer. And uh, he happened to notice that my lawn was in complete disarray. Okay. Weeds everywhere, lawns unkept, just complete madness. And at this time in his life, he was looking for some extra, you know, spending money. Okay. Industrious young man, uh, which I love to see. And so he said, Hey, why don't I take care of your lawn for you? Let me do some landscaping. I'll take care of the grass. I'll pull the weeds. You know, clearly you're too busy to handle it. Let me handle it for you. And I said, great, fantastic what are you going to charge me? And he said, well, 15 bucks an hour. And I said, why would you do that? Because that seem, seems like a reasonable, <laughs> reasonable price to charge. And I asked him, obviously trying to teach him a lesson. What do you think it's worth to me to have a well manicured lawn that I don't have to do anything for? Come home and the lawn is mowed and the flower beds look beautiful and there's no weeds in sight. And my neighbors are jealous. What's that worth to me? He goes, I don't know. So well, that's what you need to figure out. Because it sure as heck is worth more than $15 an hour. And this is what most consultants do. Right? It's like, here's my time. Here's my inputs. Is this worth something to you? <laughs> right? <laughs> I value it at X dollars per hour. I hope you value it the same way please. And thank you. You know, if you're listening to this and you're, and you're uh, a little bit insulted or triggered by my nephew's story, good. I hope you're insulted. I hope you're triggered. That's how you look when you lead with your little hourly rate. Cause nobody cares what your hourly rate is, what you think an hour of your time is worth or how long it might take you to get the job done. I didn't ask him how long will it take? I don't care how long it takes. That's his problem, not mine. Yeah. Yeah. Too harsh. hundred <laughs> percent. Not, not harsh enough in my experience. <laughs> and you know, what's, what's fascinating is watching people go through this because it, it's a process, right? I mean, we talk about it as if it's simple, but it's not simple. It's not simple to make that shift. Um, you know, it takes some, some kind of deep, messing around inside your psyche to understand, you know, how you're going to make that leap or, you know, what we often propose is a bit of a fake it until you make it uh, tactic, right? To just go out and start trying to charge more, you know, double your price and see what happens. Um, but what I think is really interesting is just how long that story sticks with people. Even after they have made, you know, they have closed the deal, the one that they come back so excited about and just, you know, stunned that the price tag is as high as it is. 
even after that, um, that doesn't quite get people there, right? It takes ongoing success, ongoing recognition of what you're actually delivering to people, right? What they're actually walking away with that helps people, helps consultants to get into the headspace where they're no longer ready to immediately fall back on the hourly rate as well. Uh, I think it comes back down to the fundamental question of what is the role of the consultant? What are you actually doing there? If you see your role as, you know, I'm going to come in, I'm going to do some work, draft some documents, send some deliverables, I'm going to do my thing and then give it to the client and then I'm done, wash my hands clean, then yeah, hourly rate is the only way that you can charge for that. If you see your role as creating value and delivering results, then why wouldn't you be charging for the value that you create or the results that you generate? And it's, it's a fundamentally different posture. There are, in every market, there are cheap consultants who see themselves as a pair of hands, who are there to do a work, do a job, collect a wage, and then go home. And they take no responsibility or interest in the results or the value that are created from the work. They're inexpensive, they're easy to find, they're interchangeable. And if that's what you want, it's your prerogative. I'm not here to judge. And then there are consultants who don't see themselves as merely somebody coming in to do a job or to execute a task, but rather they are invested in the client's results. They see themselves as creating value within the client's organization and helping the client get results and outcomes. And when you think of it that way, what you come to realize is that, well, outcomes or outputs are a whole lot more valuable and expensive than inputs, right? The inputs I put into a system are cheap. Think about a production uh, example. The, the wood that I put into a manufacturing process, it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than the mid-century modern dining tables that spit out at the end of that process. The wood is cheaper than the dining tables. When you charge for your time, you're selling the wood. You're selling the raw material. But the real value that you create is in that mid-century modern dining table that comes out at the end of the process. Right? So you, sure, you could charge a dollar for the wood, but why wouldn't you charge $10 for the table if you could? Yeah, and it's important to recognize that this isn't just about pricing. So we're talking about it from the perspective of pricing, but when you're talking about your offer, your solution, the value you provide from the perspective of you know, the thing that the client wants, right? The problem that you're solving, the, you know, the benefit that you're giving them, that is also going to change everything about the way that you speak about what you do. And so, you know, pricing is the most obvious place where that lives. But if you are thinking about what you do with a client as simply being the pair of hands, that's how you're going to talk about it. That's how you're going to feel about it. That is how you are going to approach any negotiation. That is how you are going to approach any, you know, change in scope. Everything that comes up all the way along this process is going to be influenced by the way you see the work that you do. And so, you know, pricing is almost just a proxy for the way you feel in general about what it is that you're taking out into the market. And so recognizing that I think is also critical because you may decide, oh, it's fine if I don't make, you know, as much money on this deal. And that's fair. But when you recognize that you're actually selling everything about what you do short, if that's the way you're thinking about it, that is a much bigger problem. And if you are trying to grow a business, that's a problem that you need to solve and you need to solve pretty quickly. And clients can see the difference. I mean, to attach some labels to this, you've got order takers and you've got trusted advisors. The two opposite ends of the spectrum. An order taker is an order taker, right? Oh, you need this done? Yeah, we'll handle it. You need this done? We'll handle it. They're just taking orders. Whatever the client says they need, they'll do. And their value is in doing it fast and cheap. Order takers. Trusted advisors don't just do what the client wants done. Trusted advisors ask questions. They challenge. They push the status quo. They push the envelope. They try to ensure, first of all, that the client understands what they actually need and what their real problem is, and then prescribe solutions accordingly. 
based on what's actually best for the client, not what the client says they want or thinks that they want. And clients can tell the difference, right? So if you're in a sales conversation and, uh, you know, you're talking to a client and it's, you know, well, we think we need this and there's no questions, there's no pushback, there's no, you know, the question is, when do you need it by? <laughs> Right. And you're just ready to take an order. You're, you're eager to get, you know, to get the contract drafted and get their signature on the page. They can tell this is a, this is an order taker. This guy's just waiting to close a deal. Doesn't really care if it's what we need or what we want, if it's the right thing. He's just there to sign a contract. Right. And if they're very confident in what they want and need, they may work with you for as little as humanly possible. And if they find somebody cheaper than you, they're going to work with them. Because what's one order taker over another? Find the cheapest one. Versus if in that interaction, you're asking the tough questions. Well, how do you know this is the problem? And what makes you think this is really what's going on? And how do you, how can you back up this assertion? And what do you believe is the right thing to do? And why are you going down this path? And what have you tried before? And what do you think is going to work in the future? Asking the real questions that frankly make a consultant worth their wage. That's going to communicate to them that, okay, this is somebody who's not just here to collect a check or sign a contract, but rather they are keenly interested and invested in getting an outcome. And they're already asking questions in the sales conversation that lead me to conclude and believe that they have our best interests in mind. They're looking to get a result or an outcome if there's a fit here for us to work together. And if not, then that's a different story. Or the latter has a premium price tag attached to them. Yeah. And just going back to this notion of trusted advisor, like I think that terminology is really critical because when I hire a consultant, I want to hire them because it's very clear that they know a whole bunch about things that I don't know, right? That they see something in a way that I don't see it, that they can envision a future that I can't envision, or at least I can't envision how to get there. And if I'm the person prescribing to them what will be done, immediately lose confidence. Um, I was talking to someone last week, they've built a, a very successful, you know, marketing consultancy, kind of brand management. And he, we were talking about pricing. And he said to me, yeah, I had a client the other day who actually called me because they couldn't get into their email. And I was like, yeah, I guess I can help them with that. Like, I know how that works. And we had a long conversation about like, what is it that makes them think that you're the person to call? to get into their email. Like, what is it about that? And, you know, the answer we came down to is, well, they know your hourly rate and they know you'll do what they ask. Therefore, it's worth it, right? For you to, for them to spend that much, that small amount of money to have you solve this, you know, small administrative challenge for them and they're going to call. And that's a thing that happens, right? People will, clients will just continue to decide if you're, you're talking about an hourly rate, they'll be deciding all the time, what is it worth asking them to do that fits within that price tag, as opposed to what we want, right? The, the stance that we all want to be in is, is this a problem that that person can help me solve or solve for me? And am I qualified enough for them to want to work with me, right? For them to want to support me, for them to want to enter into a contract with me as their client. I think it really comes down to whether you want to be cheap or expensive. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. And maybe you want to be cheap. Maybe that's the simplest path. Maybe that's uh, easier on your ego. I don't know, right? I, I, don't, I, I don't know why anybody would choose cheap, but I'm just entertaining the idea that it's possible that somebody would want to be cheap. If you want to be cheap, stick with hourly pricing. And that's not, and some people might be listening that, well, my hourly rate is $500. That's still cheap. It's that's a, that's a different version of cheap. You're less cheap than other people, but you're still cheap. You're certainly cheaper than the larger firm that's charging a million bucks for the same work that you're charging 500 bucks an hour for. Like relatively, you're still cheap. And that's a choice. Uh, and you can make that choice. But an hourly rate pretty much guarantees cheap because there is an upper limit to an hourly rate. There is a limit. And, and every industry is different. Every field is different. Certainly, there were you know partners at Ernst & Young back in the day when I was there that were charging $1,000 an hour. Sure, fine, right? But there is an upper limit to what a your client, your prospect is going to pay 
above which they go, well, I'm not going to pay this hourly. There's no way this person's time is worth $1,000 an hour. Like when it's framed that way, there's always going to be an upper limit to how much you can earn. But when you charge for value and results, when you anchor your price to the value that's being created by the engagement, there's no limit to that. The only limit to that is your belief and the client's belief that the value will be created. That's the limit. That's typically much higher than any kind of hourly rate limit. Yeah, and and so the question often comes up then, well, how do I even know how much to charge, right? And it's a really valid question because if you're a consultant, especially if you're a consultant with a, a very kind of specific or niche um, area of expertise or something that you're solving, you can't just kind of go into the world and, you know, check a, check a price list and understand what to pay. And so I think one of the, the things that keeps people in this, in this kind of, you know, space of fear, right, or space of comfort, charging 250 bucks an hour, whatever it is, is just really not understanding how to, how to find out what their product, what their offer, what their solution is really, really worth. So there's a couple of things here. Uh, this requires a strong consultative sales process. So again, if you're an order taker and it's like, well, whatever the client wants, I'll just do, then it's really hard to do this. You've got to, you've got to engage in a consultative sales process, which includes helping the client identify and define the problem that they're facing. That's step one in any, any strong consultative sales process. What are we actually solving for? What's the problem? And then defining what the client's ideal outcome is. What do they want to achieve? When the problem is solved, what happens? What are the consequences of solving the problem? And ideally, you want to connect that to some kind of hard metric or outcome. There's really only three that people care about. More revenue, less expense, less risk. And if you can tie your delivery, your outcome, your work to one of those three outcomes or a, a metric within those outcomes that ultimately hits either revenue or expense or risk, you can then quantify the value of your work according to those ultimate benchmarks and charge accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the other controversial statement to throw out here is that sometimes people should not want to work with you because you're too expensive. And that's okay. It's more than okay. It's desirable. Because, you know, having people self-select into or out of the solution that you are bringing to the table, again, not just about price, right? It's about the kind of client that you want to work with, the kind of client that's going to be successful, the kind of client for whom you can get those results. And so, you know, often there's this, this fear as soon as, you know, one deal doesn't close because the client has thrown out price as their reason, which we could discuss may or may not actually be the reason, um, the panic sets in. But, you know, to me, and I think we agree on this, we want consultants to be losing deals occasionally <laughs> because the client says, or the, the prospect thinks that they're too expensive. Well, it's interesting. Why would... Why would they object to price? Why would somebody say it's too expensive? Why would they present that objection? Yeah, that think is about the, it, yeah. There's a few possible reasons here. And one of them is you've given them no choice. You've failed to articulate a value proposition or convey belief in your ability to help them achieve an outcome or a result. And so it's really not too expensive and they probably have the money, but they just don't buy it. And that's the fault of the sales process. Yeah. Another possibility is that your positioning doesn't convey any meaningful distinction. So they look at who you are and what you do, and maybe they had a great conversation with you over the course of the sales process, but you still kind of look and sound like everybody else in the market, and there's somebody else coming in at 30% less than you. So then why choose you over somebody that looks and sounds exactly the same and pay a premium? doesn't make sense. That's another possibility. And finally, third possibility, this is not exhaustive, exhaustive by any means, is they're just the kind of client that doesn't pay a premium. They like, to, they like to buy things for cheap. 
in which case you're selling to the wrong people. Unless that's your strategy, which again, I don't know why it would be. I don't, because, you know, consulting is different from any, you know, from, from, from other markets. There are, if I'm selling widgets, you know, and I have a competitive advantage where I can source the widgets for cheaper and sell them for cheaper and I can win, win the game on scale, fine. Coming in cheaper is a business strategy that makes sense. When you are fundamentally selling some unit of time or expertise your, or energy, whether that's yours or your team's, coming in at the cheapest is a terrible business strategy because you can't manufacture more time. You can't manufacture uh, time more efficiently than in my previous example, somebody can manufacture widgets. I mean, maybe you find a cheaper way to make widgets. You can't find a cheaper way to make time. So undercutting, coming in low, terrible business strategy. Common one, though. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and you know, what you're speaking to is maybe the most important point to take away from this conversation today is that the price objection, very rarely a price objection. Now, yes, is there, are there times where the person just like really doesn't have the money? Sure. But more often than not, it is one of these other things. And the challenge is, you know, in or after the sales conversation, it's way easier to grab onto, well, price was the reason. Because price doesn't reflect on me, right? Price is their problem, right? Money is their issue. When if I really have to face that it is the way I presented the solution, that it's the way I spoke about it, that it was the posture I took, you know, any of those things, when I have to look at those um, at the end of a unsuccessful sales conversation, that's a way more uncomfortable place to be. And so, you know, starting from the stance of it's never price <laughs> is, is really the place to, to be because that's going to help you get to the place where you are getting better, right? Where you are presenting um, your solution in a way that is compelling enough that price, quite frankly, becomes almost a non-issue. I mean, that's the opposite end of the scale where any number you would put on the table, the person is pretty much going to be willing to pay because you have really shown them the path, right? You have really shown them what it is that you can do. 